Um, along my journey, I needed help, so I had different coaches. John Himmler to start with. Um, I did Carter for about two years, and I went through two and a half years of a three-year program with WLP. Um, coaching's good. Um, what you need to understand is you need to find your own voice as a chiropractor. Okay, don't become a puppet of someone else, but by having coaches, they can give you the foundation that you can springboard off and find your own voice. I think coaches have a lot of benefit in helping you grow as a chiropractor. So if you want to be able to communicate the need for chiropractic care, you must first be able to show the need for that care. Is pain a good enough need? And if a patient came in with no pain and had an extremely distorted spine, do they need care? Right, because if we're basing it just off pain, we're going to miss a significant portion of what we can do as chiropractors. Now, I love this little quote I've got on my business card. One can't prove, disprove, or improve which one can't measure. All right, if you can give patients some tangible measuring tools, then you can actually give them options. Hey, where do you want to improve in your health? Does that sort of make sense to you? Pain's one of them. Do you want to get out of pain? Great. But if you can't offer anything else other than pain, then you're cutting yourself a little short of what you can do for patients. So if we're going to measure subluxation, these are the five components that we're taught at uni, kinesiopathology, neuropathology, myopathology, histopathology, and biomechanical or true pathology. So how do we measure those components? <coughs> kinesiopathology, we can look at structure, okay, because structure does govern function. What's the best way to look at your structure? X-ray, okay. Functionally, we can do motion or motion palpation. Now, some studies will say that it's not reliable. Other studies will say that it is reliable, okay. It doesn't matter if it is or it isn't. Is it reproducible with what you're doing? Okay, can you show that you're <coughs> making improvements? Now, to me, turning the patient's head to the left and the right is not cutting it. Oh, you're a bit jammed there, Bob. And that side, you're a bit more restricted. You feel that on the right, but can we measure it more accurately? And as Peter's gone and spoken about, we've got segmental and global subluxations. The segmental is some of your Gonstead listings, okay, other listing systems, and your global subluxations. The best listing system is the CBP um, technique because it lists head shifts, thoracic shifts, and pelvic shifts, and rotations. So the amount of permutations that you can find in someone's spine is huge. Okay, these are two films that I pulled up. Pete's gone through the ideal, straight with three natural curves. Um, okay, line drawing, we've just spoken about that. Now, are the students using line drawings at all? Yep, and that's based on Gonstead line drawing analysis? Uh, well, in terms of abnormality, so straight out of the open road. Yep, PI pelvis. We don't get to all that. Okay, so from what I understand, you're actually adjusting fixated segments. So if the joint's not moving, the goal is to put movement back into yes. that. Yep. So you're not, are you drawing like George's line and looking for yeah, the the lines translation and stuff? Yeah, okay. not, um, like God said, I want to. So the great thing, this is um, out of um, spine logic. All right. We're looking at blue line, red line, and all the red bars indicating that there's major problems with this spine. Now, if a patient came in and didn't have any neck pain, how would you communicate to them that there's a problem there? I'd cry. I'd just start crying for them spontaneously. Just... What, what, what could you say to them? Hey, Bob, you're a bit bent. Okay. So what I'm going to do is show you the ways that I communicate with patients um, and what we can actually offer them um, being a chiropractor. Lumbar spine. Okay. Now, when you look at spinal position with the CVP model, there's ideal curvatures and ideal, ideal rotation angles in between each vertebra. And that'll flag them, so it's really great when you use spine logic, you just click your points or your text here and clicks your points. And then when you look at it, you go, oh, we've got four, four red bars. What does that mean? Oh, that's a problem there, that's a problem there. And you can write that in. And you might actually def define your adjustment based on what you're seeing with those spinal x-rays, okay? so. I guess looking for a cookbook solution, you're never going to change a person's posture or spine in one adjustment, have a long lasting change. And I guess I push some buttons here, but if, if 
chiropractors are telling patients that they're putting it back in, um, can you prove it to me please? Because if you're saying to a patient, hey Bob, I've cracked you, I've put it back in, we should be able to see a pre-X-ray and a post-X-ray straight after the adjustment. What should we see on that X-ray? It's put back in, all right? You would have to put an almighty force to be able to change it. When you're putting it back in, if it's a patient that's out to antalgic, that's a pain response that they're actually responding to, they might go back in. But that's not exactly a bone out of place getting put back in, is it? It's the body moving back into a better position. So, by using your x-ray analysis, you can look at your structure in terms of segmental and also global subluxations. When we do a functional assessment, we want to measure kinesiopathology, range of motion. So what we use in our clinic is what we call a CROM. We sit the patient down, we put some pretty funky glasses on, put uh, magnets, north, north, south, and we orientate the top centre. So we can get heads to turn, I can measure 72 degrees and 45 degrees, okay? Spin the patient around, hold the shoulder, put the finger on their chin, and get them to laterally flex. We can measure normal ranges of lateral flexion, okay? Now for a healthy rotation, we should be getting 80 to 90 degrees, and for lateral flexion, we should be getting a range of 40 to 50, okay? So that's another way that we can measure a patient's function. So then I could say, hey, you, on your lateral flexion, we found that you've got a 20 degree lateral flexion, normal's 40. Oh, it doesn't give me any pain, there's a problem there. Then we can link that to the person's structure. We use sit and reach, okay? What should we be able to do as, as healthy humans? Touch, Touch your toes. Your toes. We should actually be able to go past those. So when you have a look at the studies, even just getting to zero, you should be going past that. All right. So we've got standard deviations away from normal. Bilateral weight scales. What do you think they tell us? Whether or not we're translating to one side, distorting our weight on one side or the other. Okay. We're only looking at at from um, sagittal. We're not looking at from coronal. Right, so if we're using a pressure plate, that would be a lot more accurate because we can actually see whether or not they're putting more pressure on the front of their feet or on their heels. But when we tie that into a posture photo, we can see whether or not the patient's skiing or we've got distortions this way. We can have a look at what's happening with the weight distribution. So these are just other telltale signs. It doesn't determine what is wrong with that patient. They're just measuring tools. Okay, so when we communicate back to the patient, we can say, Bob, you've got X, Y, Z, you're carrying an 8 kilo heavier load on your right leg. Do you know that in an adult that's going to lead to arthritic change and osteoporosis in that side where you're carrying more weight down one side? We can check children and see whether or not they're leaning to one side. Now, if I was to test your bilateral weight scales, would I test you once or more than once? Why? People change the way they stand. Yep. So, it's not just stand on there, wait till the scales lock in, you've got to look at what the patient's doing as well. Okay, if you see them shaking, what do you think that's telling you? Nervous. Yeah, their nervous system's a bit shot, they're not being able to stabilise themselves. So sometimes when I pop someone on there, I'll be looking straight along at the scales and seeing it, and if I think something's going on, I'll get them to do that test two or three times. Now here's the kicker, when you're doing the science, the first time we check posture, how is someone going to stand? Normally, when they become educated and they're aware of posture, how do you think they're going to stand the second time? All right, so we've got to be clever to make sure that that patient's, when we're retesting, we're trying to make it as accurate as possible. If someone knows that they're 10 kilos heavier on one side, what do you think they're subconsciously going to do when they jump on those scales again? They will. No one wants to be 10 kilos different. So when we're using these tests, tests, we've got to look at how we're testing and try and make it as reproducible as we possibly can.